welcome everybody to the one to go show presented by our friends right here at dirt track supply on a tuesday a rare tuesday recording we're with the whole gang back together it is puka it is ryan ale and it is bert layman great to have everyone back real quick ryan's got some swag i got some swags we got some swag nothing set up online yet <laughs> bert, i don't know that <laughs> i don't know what to say about that one ryan uh, people are asking if he's fired. He might be, right? I, I, I don't know what is worse, that yeah. shirt or the visor, flat build stuff. I, 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 now, if I see Bert wearing that shirt with a flat build visor, I, I, I'm going to, it just, that might draw the line. Have right to talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome, guys. Uh, episode 96, getting closer and closer to 100. Got a lot to talk about. Obviously, Labor Day weekend, one of the busiest weekends in dirt track racing in the Midwest because obviously temperatures start getting cold. So we're starting to get into that special season and, and uh, many tracks have wrapped up now. Uh, but yeah, n- episode 96, Ryan, why don't you tell the fans the tradition Bert, here? Who do you got? So every week, every week when we come out with a new episode, now when we get to 100, we might change it back and go back to one. It, we'll talk about that. If we have a 101, 102, so on, we'll do that. But we might go back to... But where we talk about who are some drivers that come to mind with that number. So, Bert, we're going to start with you. Number 96, who do you got? The fans want to hear from you, Bert. It's been a while. <laughs> um, one of the best drivers to ever get behind the wheel of a race car in northeast Wisconsin, uh, Roger the Bear Regas. Um, okay. Tell us a little bit about him. What did he race? Uh, where well, after he, you? he raced in the 1960s, 1970s. Um, and he, he came back actually, and uh, well, he, I mean, he raced late models, um, well, what con- were considered late models at that time. Um, but then he came back in the 90s and raced the Grand National car. But uh, he was uh, one of the best drivers ever in Northeast Wisconsin, and uh, he was from the stories that I hear, um, he never got intimidated, he was always the one doing the intimidating, and uh, he. He had an aggressive driving style. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> I like this guy already. He, I, I like him already. I wish there was videos. I mean, I, I can be friends with this guy. So, yeah, get us, a, get us a picture. We'll try to get that up. Puka, I got a bunch of them. Who do you got? Oh, well, I got two, I believe. Uh, I've got a guy. Like, last week I was Keith Foss down by Rochester. I've got another guy who I believe was from down by Rochester in a late model in the early 90s, John Herrick, H-E-R-R-I-C-K, he something like that. 96, because his son was six, and, and they bought a car for me. They bought my late model, the Herricks did. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So I got him. and Nick then Herrick. His kid was Nick Herrick. Okay, yes. Yes, I remember yep. that name. Yep, okay. So I've got him, and then Roger Nimi. Yes, the flying fin. Yeah, there another guy go. watched win a lot of races in a six cylinder and super stock and hitting. Yeah, he won a lot there, and and I actually uh, he was sponsored by Peterson Well Drilling. They still go to the races. I know he watches the show as well. But uh, yeah, I, I was actually good friends with his son, who we lost way too young at a, at a really young age. But uh, Roger Nimi, he still gets over to the racetrack and hitting every once in a while. So I won't go with Roger Nimi because you already got that one, but I got three. So well, I'm, I'm going to ask you, I'll, I'll give you the description. You tell me if you can figure out the name. Ran a mod, extremely successful, ran very well, kind of over in western Minnesota, Fargo area, Alexandria, like the half miles, and then absolutely dominated the Wasota modified scene with his chassis brand. Well, it's got to be Jay. Jay McDonald. McDonald, yep. <laughs> and then he took a couple of years off because, quite frankly, he got sick of people and he got back into it again. And uh, I know that um, he, he still has some good hot rods out there. Clayton Wagaman, of course, you know, he runs very well. And then the hot the Carl, Jamie Nelson. I'm telling you, hot Carl, he put together some laps and hibbing. That, he, yeah. that thing's fast. So, so Jay McDonald, that would be number one. Another one, okay? This gentleman right here. Got absolutely screwed over so bad the second day of Labor Day this year that he loaded up and went home. Oh uh, boy, I don't know why. I know Steve Larson is one of the guys that loaded up when he was he 96 for a while. He was number 96. He had a 919, 
96. I got a picture of his car. I don't know if I have one here. Maybe I can find it online. But he has he was number 96 for a little while as well. So really? Steve Larson. Wow. That is correct. Now, the next one I have was up at the Riverview Raceway in Thunder Bay. Remember, Dennis Jones got upside down in a modified. This guy, literally, Jones was knocked out, trapped in the car. Window net was kind of frozen up. This guy drug him out of the fire and basically saved his life. Got a Medal of Honor for it, actually, up in uh, up in Canada. Really? Oof, I have no idea of that one. Don Kettering. Oh, yes. There's Don a name. Kettering. <laughs> he was back in the 80s. I remember when I was a little kid, they'd come all over here after Labor Day. I'm at my parents' house right now. And they'd come over here, and, and I was that little kid that they'd be like, you got to go to sleep. And I'd prowl down the hall, and I just wanted to be part of it, and I'd be listening to him talk about racing and all that. And he'd be like, oh, come on, buddy. You can come out here and hang out with us. But uh, Don Kettering, we lost him a few years back. And uh, wow. But, yeah, um, Dennis Jones, uh, he saved his life up, up there. It was actually on the Discovery Channel. They had a whole documentary on it. It was a pretty cool deal. Jeez. Awesome. Yep. Okay. So let's get well, to it. You talked about Dirt Track Supply. You want to give a tip of the cap, a big shout out, and a thank you to Ron, of course, to Trevor over there in Watertown, South Dakota. They service a ton of racetracks. They got winning race cars, and Ocastro got another win this weekend. And, you know, they're, I know they're out in Watertown, and the invitational season is here. The season is winding down, but you still might need work done. You might need parts. You might need tires. You might need safety, safety stuff. Give those guys a call. They've been doing it a long time. And uh, I'm telling you, they got a lot of respect in the racing community. Well, both Trevor and his dad used to win a lot of races too. But uh, they've been doing it right for a long time. So get a hold of those guys. And Puka, episode 96, what do you say we start with the races we went to? Bert, we'll Bert. start with you. We, 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 we're missing our Bert, right? So <laughs> did you go to Shano? Yes, I did go to Shano. Uh, it was uh, the Shano County Fair. So it was a... It was the races during the fair. Um, those races are always special for me because my grandpa was uh, uh, part of the fair board for over 40 years. And um, he was president for 17. And I know he was always very proud of the fair. And uh, it was always, a we always, as a family, we always made a point to go to the fair races. So uh, fair races are always special for me. Um, the... I mean, we got a lot of rain last week, so it was a it was a heavy track, uh, probably the heaviest track of the year. Um, <laughs> they had to call all the cars out to pack the track, but it wasn't as bad as it was uh, that one time when earlier this year when they called all the cars out and and they weren't able to get it packed in. But anyway, uh, Nick Avalink uh, wound up finishing second, so another podium, uh, but he couldn't quite get the win. Uh, but uh, a driver who's had a lot of bad luck this year uh, pulled into victory lane this year at uh, at Shano. Uh, Justin Ritchie, he was he was there and uh, won the feature. Uh, Nick was second. Uh, well, I think Nick was second, and then Brett Swedberg was third. Um, Nick and Brett were battling. The last few laps were really, really fun to watch because those two were battling. Uh, There's um, Scra scraping some metal and uh there's a lot of restarts the last few laps also so uh um justin ritchie got the win and uh kyle redant uh, won the championship oh he um, did he did yeah he got done getting the championship up there yeah congratulations I mean, kyle redant. yeah i mean congratulations to him i mean shano had a lot of drivers who missed at least one week um, so that put them back, but I mean, it's still, it's still a good accomplishment to win a championship. <clears throat> Absolutely. No, I got a question for you. And this leads us to our fan. One of our fan questions of the week brought to you by Cowboy Up Racing, Shane Hall. This gentleman is Randy Widener. He's from over in your direction there. Yep. And I know Randy. Yep. And the question he had was on packing. You mentioned they had to pack it in. So I remember back in the day, we'd go to a lot of tracks and they'd be packing the wrong way around the racetrack. And he's like, how come some cars, some places they go backwards, some, some they go forward. First of all, how do they pack in Shano? Which, which direction do they go there? In Shano, they, they pack it opposite. Uh, so they, they drive backwards. Okay. And, and actually a friend of ours, listener of the show, Brett, he actually had probably the best comment. And it was, I'm going to totally agree with what he said. It's not necessarily going against the direction of the racing. It's going in the direction opposite of what they graded. 
because they kind of bring up the little furls and when they pack it the opposite way, that packs it back down ra rather than peeling it up. And so it, it's really curious, keep an eye on which direction does it grate or grate around the racetrack. Typically you'll see them packing the other way. Now Puka, let's be honest. I mean, I don't think most of our drivers in our area even have a mud scraper. So packing <laughs> is, uh, it's not something we not see an issue. <laughs> anymore. So I, uh, and some drivers are like, I don't want to pack. I don't want a heavy racetrack. It's too hard on equipment, but you also don't want a dust bowl one lane either. So I would say what Brett posted on there, in my opinion, do you guys have any thoughts on that? Um, as far as packing opposite direction. Well, uh, go ahead. I'll go ahead. I said, I just remember, like you said, right. As a kid, they were, you know, young kid. You know, I was, you know, whatever, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I just remember the mud flying. I mean, remember, I mean, regular night, just mud flying everywhere. The cars had mud all over the top of them, on the hood, on the roof. And they were always packing in the opposite direction. I don't know when that changed. I remember then, whatever, must have been like the hobby stock class would be out there. And then for hot laps, they literally waved the green flag and they would spin around from packing. They would just spin around and then start hot lapping and it just saved some time, I guess. You didn't pull everyone off. And have to, they just wave the green, they would spin around and start going. So, like I said, I never knew why, but I know it ended at some point. I don't remember when, and yeah, here we are. Yeah, and, and that's the thing is, first of all, I'd love to see tracks get back to packing, right? Because I don't like seeing dust bowls in race one. That that really frustrates me. So, first of all, let's get back to packing. But uh, I think that's the right answer. Just they want to make sure that they're not peeling the track up as they go. You don't really see that very often. It's usually when it rains or something, when, when people have to pack now. But what do you say we get in, in the – so anything else on Shano there, Bert, before we jump off that? Um, no. I mean, other than, I mean, it was a it was a good season at Shano. And uh, uh, Nick Avalink uh, definitely uh, – I don't know if he thought he had something to prove or not this year. But, I mean, he definitely – I think he ended with nine victories – uh, at Shano. And the thing about his wins is, I mean, he's usually starting eighth in the feature. It's not like he's starting in on the pole or, you know, starting in the front two rows because he's won the way they line, they do the lineup for the features. You know, if you, if you win a lot, you're going to be starting, you know, eighth, seventh, eighth, you know, every feature. And that just, that didn't, stop him from still winning <laughs> right and he traveled well he went to cedar lake he won he went to menominee he ran well so he traveled very well so probably not a c c plus this year for nick probably Pro gonna be a probably higher. not probably not <laughs> <laughs> so hookah it is invite time right you know it's invite time brought to you by vernon racing who tip of the cap tyler vernon we'll talk about him in a minute winning the labor day shootout but there was four big ones this weekend. We'll touch on a little bit on the other ones as well. I went to the Silver 1000. Did either of you watch the Silver 1000 online? Oh, yeah. Well, the, the late model portion. The late model not. portion. <laughs> so, so from what you saw online, you know, what stuck out to you? Of course, you know, Travis Budislavich, he parked it in victory lane. Jesse Glenn's tried everything he could to get to him. He got second. Giassi got third. But what stuck out to you in the late model feature? Yeah, not, nothing real out of the ordinary, kind of what I expected. I figured Glenn's would be there. I figured Giassi would be up there. I figured Dor would be up there. I know Massengill had a really good run. I think he was the hard charger and up about sixth or so. Uh, one thing is, you know, Giassi with that third yeah, third place finish, just disappointing that he didn't make the rest of the, the trip. You know, he, he went home. He wasn't there Friday. He wasn't there Saturday or Sunday for Labor Day. Um, so a little bit disappointed there. I did catch a little bit of the mod, so I'll turn it over to you, ask you about the lates, and I do have a couple of comments on the mods because I did watch about the last 10 laps, but what stood out for you in the late model feature down there? The points that Budislavich had, because, you know, he he made it through lap traffic, and he had Jesse Glenn breathing down his neck, and Giassi was right behind him, and if he would have got trapped behind a lap car, it was over. It was absolutely over. Glenn's was going by, but he had poised through that lap traffic to where he he had the patience and he just hit his spots right. And he couldn't have really handled lap traffic any better. And of course, Troy and Jonathan Powers, you know, Troy's dad passed away. They had a yeah. really cool bonus. 2000 it was 2020 for the 2020 racing page, a 2020 bonus. If you led the halfway mark and there was other bonuses as well, Budislavich led that. Let's just say that 
that was a very lucrative win for the 31 <laughs> team. So the modified portion, right? It was a Jim and Jerry Inman uh, memorial race. Of course, the Inman family been around there for a long time. Another tip of the cap to my buddy, Lauren Inman. He did an awesome job raising a bunch of money to add to the purse. And, you know, we had a fan bonus deal as well. And actually, that was kind of cool because Dick Chrisman, who's a legend, right? We've watched Dick Chrisman forever. His grandson was matched up with the driver that won the feature. He walked away with 600 bucks cash. So that was super cool. Got That's to visit cool. with Dick Chrisman. But in the feature, the Hermantown Hammer, Daryl Nelson, he parked it in victory lane. Ashley Anderson, who's been red hot, he got second. Brandon Kopp got third. Now, here's the deal. There was a yellow with like three to go. Yeah. Daryl was into heavy lap traffic. And I'm here to tell you, Cop was in second at the time. Anderson was hunting. I'm telling you, I that looked, that had the look that it was going to go in a completely different direction. But when the yellow came out, it was all over. Daryl had fresh air. He drove away and uh, and Anderson got by Cop in the second. Pretty good race. And what the only disappointing part of the whole night for me is – it was pretty heavy, right? And it was just got to the final B main and Steve Larson looked really good on the bottom. And it's like, now we got a racetrack. These features are going to be awesome, right? And then it rained. And then it rained. <laughs> and then the bottom was greasy and it took forever to kind of get it back in. And towards the end of the late model feature, it was better, but it wasn't great. And uh, just Mother Nature kind of threw a curveball. And it is what it is. They, they got the race in, you know, which was cool. But it's just one of those things where you get some moisture on that red clay and it can get kind of ugly. Now, Kill Switch Carl. So Hot Carl, he nicknamed himself Kill Switch Carl. Did you see that deal in the heat? Uh, race? I, yeah, I actually, and then uh, he had some in car footage where, yeah, he, uh, yeah, Kill Switch Carl made it happen. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Started he, the front row. He did. And he wadded the whole field up, including Johnny Broking, who was probably one of the favorites to win. Bob's, I think he's won that race twice. And Bob ended up having a bad night. Neither one of them started the B main, neither Broking, but he felt bad. He's like, oh my gosh, like seriously, he took that switch right out of there. So drivers, okay. If you're watching this and you have your hand on the steering wheel, you got your brake adjuster right here. Okay. If your kill switch is next to you, okay. You get a donkey award. OK, you've been you've been warned that switch does not go here. you got to reach up past the steering wheel. It's got to be on the dash. I've seen people shut it off. It makes no sense why cars still. I don't know why people still put it there. It makes no sense why they'd even come there in a race car. So put your kill switch where you're not going to shut the car off. I promise you a hot car will never have that happen again. So the silver 1000 was good. Any closing thoughts on the silver? Well, just you were talking about Ashley and Cop, and it looks like that last restart there. I think Ashley, you know, he he stuffed uh, Brandon pretty good on the wall in the front stretch. I don't know if you saw that, but uh, that was one thing. And then um, Buzzy had a good run. You know, he was got the hard charging mods. I think he was plus thirteen. Uh, but um, yeah, really good night. You know, for Buzzy, another guy like I said, just you know, dabble. You know, him and AJ Demo, they dabble in racing. You know, three weeks off, come out run great. Three weeks off, come out run great. So. It was cool to see Buzzy run some laps and, and, and do pretty well there, too. Yeah, I found myself watching Buzzy more than the leader sometimes because he was up on the pump on the high side. It don't matter if he's first or 82nd, he's charging. No matter where he's <laughs> at, he's always on the wheels. So that led us over to the Grand Rapids Speedway on Friday night. They had the 27th annual Wissota Classic. And, of course, there was a bunch of cars there. One that stuck out to me that showed up, 14-year-old Kennedy Swan, put an absolute curb stomping on him in the heat race. She was going to roll off outside of row number one. I so badly wanted to see that because there was some moisture in the track. She's really good with a little bit of moisture. Oh, uh, I guess we'll never know. I guess yeah. we'll never know if she was going to have something for the boys. But uh, the only feature that got in was the super stock feature. We're going to talk a little bit more about that, you know, but first of all, you know, it kind of missed it all night. It was one of those deals where you look at the radar, no rain. It's a 10% chance or 5% chance of rain. It's like, what are they, what are they talking about? It's raining now, right? Yep. So don't trust the weather, man. They're lying to you always, okay? So it missed it the whole time. But to get the feature out there for the Supers, and it missed the entire feature, right? right? All the way, zero cautions, right? All the way until two to go, okay? So Bert. Here's what happened, because I know you didn't see this yet, right? Correct. So, so Taryn Spacek is leading. 
and he's a second generation driver, really good driver from Donald, Wisconsin. Sabraski's in second. DJ Keeler, Kevin Burdick battling it out for, for third. Okay. Now the storyline is this coming into this race, Burdick had a 10 point lead on Shane Sabraski, both of them chucking second place finishes, right? So needless to say, if somebody won that race, they were going to gain five points. So vitally important in the national championship race. They take two to go, missing. They come down the back straightaway. The leaders do, and Terrence Spacek smack drives right in the back of Dalton Carlson, spins him out getting into turn three. I don't think he saw him. I think he was fogged up and, you know, whatever. Needless to say, he got into him. After he spun him, he comes through three and four, Bert. Doug Koski blows up, and he hit him wide open. I mean, he folded the bumper and the nose and the fenders. I mean, he hit him a ton. Yellow flag comes out, and they t- have a little discussion, and they put the 57 to the back. I'm like, wait, what, what just happened here? Like, I mean, he clearly drove in. It wasn't on purpose. He ain't trying to spin out a lapper, but he was out of tear-offs, right? And I think the guy just lifted earlier than he thought. He dumped him, spun around. So they give Terrence Spacek his spot back on the front row. The whole front of the car is mangled, right? And you know when you have the nose down on the tire, who knows if it's going to turn, getting into turn one. So donkey award to the Grand Rapids Speedway. First of all, for making the wrong call, we're going to get into that in just a second. okay? But the worst part is it was the first caution of the race. They throw the checkered flag. They didn't even go green, white, checkered. I'm like, (laughs) How the hell does that happen? I, I get it. It's missing, but it missed it the whole race, right? National title implications on the line. In my mind, Bert, Burdick got a gift here, right? Because Sebrasti should have been given the lead. And if he was given the lead and they checkered it, it was it would have been right. And he got the win. Sebrasti was not happy. He got flat out robbed of a win. And if it comes down to a national title by one or two points and, and uh, he doesn't get this one, that's gonna sting. Mm. That was that one will sting. That one was that was not a good deal. So I want your take on that whole ordeal, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the officiating. But I'll talk a little bit about what was your thoughts as a race fan, Puka. One yellow, and then all that happens, knowing what was on the line. What is your what's your thoughts on that? Well, yeah, well, let's go back to Terrence collecting. By the way, we do have an interview up on the Facebook channel and the YouTube channel with uh, the eventual little uh, Terrence SpaceX. You can check that out. Uh, so he did get into to Carlson was his fault as we're sitting there. We're wondering what are they going to do considering the weather, considering it's raining, were they going to give him the benefit of the doubt? Were they going to say it was kind of, you know, rain related, which obviously they ended up doing. Uh, and then, you know, like you said, when he hit Doug Koski, that was right in front of him. And you could just hear metal, just metal to metal. Like, er, er, you know, it was, yes, he hit him hard. Unfortunately, Doug blew up. I uh, was just posting and, and I, like I said, during the interview, you could see, you said I was out of tear offs. He said, and there was just moisture and I just, I just couldn't see. And, and of course, you know more about that than us, as far as how much mud is actually getting collected up there, but wrong call, but maybe right call if they felt, cause you don't know, they could have been discussing right then saying, Hey, look, we, we got to get this thing. You know, we got to get this thing to checker. We got to get these cars off the track. You know, this is just getting bad. Uh, we don't know what discussions they were having, but uh, yeah, tough night for Sebraski. Like you said, could have been a win. Should have maybe been a win, but you know, like I said, I think they were just, I think they were just trying to maybe do some leader protection there due to the, the mist and it just missed it, missed it. I mean, it missed it all day here really. And then about four in the afternoon, like the streets and stuff finally were dry, you know, and I thought it was just kind of done. And, and then it, yeah, it just fired up here and there. And then by the way, race fans, 15 minutes after they canceled, the mist went away and there wasn't wind. It was 100%. It was like the per- perfect night for racing. No wind, heavy air, 100% humidity. But by then, half the pits were peeled out. <laughs> See, that surprised me. That surprised me. And, and I, they have the reasons. I guess I, I haven't even got what their whole reason was. And they said curfew, but they always have a curfew. Um, I In my mind, because they paid out the purse. They paid out the full purse. For the classes that didn't run, they took whatever their total purse was, divided by the car number. The, the amount of cars in that race and they paid everybody equally okay I, i'm shocked i'm a little bit surprised that they didn't go you know what let's just wait a half hour who cares if we run till one in the morning it's invitational season let's get it in right i'm surprised they didn't do that 
you know, I guess it is what it is. I mean, I didn't really hear a ton of complaining about it, so to speak, you know, because they would have had to pack it in and drivers don't like to pack. I get all that. Right. But I, I feel like as a fan, I'm like, I think they could have got that in probably, but who knows? I mean, I guess would have, could have, should have. It is what it is. But the winner there, Taryn SpaceX, that's a big win. This SpaceX has been coming up for a long time. So at the end of the day, congrats to him. Now, a question I have for you is this. Okay, I got another donkey award there from Rapids, by the way. In the heat race, did you want uh, in the modified heat? Where they took this is good stuff. They took the top three to the redraw in the mods. Hot Carl was racing. He was in third. Okay, he was racing. He's looking good. And Brandon Cobb threw a slider on him that missed by a mile. It was a Bobby Pierce. Oh, just drilled him in turn one and two. I'm like, oh boy, Hot Carl was not happy. He drove up next to him. He's like, I just want to have fun and drink beer. Like, oh, we got to do this, really? Brandon texts me, says, you got to give me a donkey award. I feel like a jackass. He goes, <laughs> not only did I give him a dirty slide, but it didn't clear. And then we didn't run the feature anyway, so it didn't even matter. So now I really feel stupid about the deal. So donkey award, Brandon Cobb. But I got a question on officiating, right? Because you know, I've been, I got multiple, like in Hibbing, my God, on, on the first day of Hibbing, I don't think I saw more blowing, even the second day, so many blowing calls, right? Grand Rapids, that was a blowing call. I had people text me from Viking Speedway, man, this call and that call. Okay, now the question I have is this, have you guys ever watched a race from the infield? Yes. Okay. Yes. Do things happen? They, they seem to happen really fast because your vantage point is here. Okay. So when you go myself, I went to three Minnesota Vikings games two years ago. Yes, Bert, Minnesota Vikings. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I went to three games and I sat on the front row, very front row, right? I sat about 20 rows up and then I sat all the way up, like literally two rows from the top. Do you know what my favorite seat was? Two rows from the top, because I could see. You can see the whole play developing. Your whole perspective of everything is so much different, right? So we're critical a lot of times, me especially, of officiating. When I was racing, extremely, extremely critical of officiating, right? So we got another question here, a fan question of the week. And I, I don't remember who asked the question here. I don't have it in front of me, but it is what it is. We have a fan question of the week. Should there be a better perception? I'm looking here, and I can't find who it was. But should we have a better perception, right? Should we have a better vantage point for the corner workers? Because they're in the middle, and all they see is this little slice of pie, and things happen so fast. Well, Puka, how many times were we up in the booth, and we're looking down, and we're like, well, how did they get that wrong? How is that even possible, right? In my mind, all, all tracks should really take this to note. This is like really a constructive criticism deal. I truly believe that the corner workers should no longer be in the infield. They should be up in the, they should have a press box, like a, a scorer's box. They should be all the way up top so they can see the whole vantage point. They can see so much better there for the life of me. I don't understand why they're there. I, I'm thinking like at a NASCAR race, they don't, I know they don't make calls or whatever, but they don't have officials in the infield watching the track, right? They're watching from a eye in the sky type of view. And, you know, so what's your thoughts on that? Should they move the corner workers to a better vantage point? Go ahead, Bert. Well, <clears throat> um, like in Eastern Wisconsin, uh, corner workers kind of have a dual purpose. I mean, not only do they make calls, uh, but um, they're there to get to the driver as quick as possible in case there's an accident, um, so, you know. So that's always been my perception of a corner worker is they're there to um, get on the track to a driver if there's an accident, but they're also there to make calls um, if, if that's what the rules that that track follows, you know. Obviously, we've talked about the no fault rule and all, you know, all those other ones. So depending on on what rules the track has determines if they have corner workers who actually make calls. Well, well, that's it. By the way, I think it was Jason, Ryan, that asked this question. I think I see it in the notes here. But what, wouldn't a head judge 
solve this problem? You know, if a head judge is up there and he sees and you're kind of discuss things, I, I guess I always thought that there was a head judge until it's been, you know, more recently that I realized like, yeah, the kind of listening to the corner judge and the corner judge only. If I was a promoter, I probably want to be the head judge. I'd want to be the one making that final call on a tough call, I think. But, um, but yeah, you're right. Watching a race from the infield is completely different. I mean, you watch some of those races and you're just spinning around watching how fast they are. It's incredible compared to sitting on the outside and watching everything. So if you ever get a chance as a fan to get down there, check that out and you'll have a whole different appreciation of actually some of the speeds. And this is 20 years ago. That I right. And we talked to Thad Johansson about that, right? Thad's been a corner guy, flag guy. He's been involved yeah. in all of it. And he says, you know, he talked to some people and said, come on down here and see what you see. And they're like, yeah. wow. And if you're not paying attention, if you're up in the booth and you're not quite paying attention, you still have that peripheral. But if you're down kind of in the corner and you're just right there and you're not quite paying attention, because let's face it, it just happens, right? I mean, things happen so dang fast. I mean, it just happens so fast. And maybe they should have two people in the booth, one watching each corner, right? You know, I, I'm just, uh, I truly believe that they need to move them because I don't feel like a lot of calls are getting missed simply because of a bad vantage point. And the fan questions of the week always are brought to us by, of course, Cowboy Up Racing, Shane Hall, and, and Puka, I got to do it. I got to do it. I have to do it. I got to give Shane Hall a donkey award. I didn't see it. I need the perspective. I have to do it. So he got yard sale. He did. I watched. He got. He got. He got moved. It was good hard racing, but he got dirty. So they're battling for the lead up front at the Viking Speedway this week, and they had their double header. And and uh, Ron Sauer. Okay, he's got a B mod number number forty two, and Travis Sauer has a B mod number forty two. I think one has a green number, one has a white number. But other than that, they look pretty darn identical okay so i can see him being upset because he got banged into and ron sauer goes on to win and the donkey award though is kind of funny and i told him i said I'm, i gotta do it he went into the tech area right and he started yelling at travis sauer just screaming at him He's like you're a usmts guy can't even win a b-mod race he's just mad just screaming right travis is like my dad ran into you, not me, like a rock person. And he's like, oh, my bad. <laughs> so I got to be honest, I've seen that a few times. Every time I see it, I just laugh. It's like, I, I think it was Donnie Loftel got ro ran or rolled over. And I think he was running down the back straightaway. And I don't remember who the parties were involved, but he went screaming at somebody in Proctor. And they're like, yeah, wrong guy. You're not even yelling at the wrong right guy, you know? So it's funny when that happens. So uh, Shane Hall, uh, I know he's a sponsor of the show, but congratulations on your donkey award this week. But uh, let's get to the Labor Day shootout. Of course, uh, day one, they had late models and modified features. Day two, they had all the features for the six classes. You know, Puka, if you want to give just a really quick recap, what stuck out to you at the at the Labor Day shootout at the Hibbing Raceway this year? Yeah, yeah. And we'll go through this quick, fans, because you can find me and Ryan did a ton of coverage. Go to the YouTube, go to the Facebook. There's a bunch of stuff out there if you want to get a real more detailed recap. Uh, I think the big news story was, of course, the local boy, Skeeter SD, you know, sweeping the modifieds with a car built right in Hibbing. So that was, that was a pretty good story. I did get an interview with Skeeter night one, uh, but too much photobombing in the background. And by the time I got to the pits on Sunday, unfortunately, I'd already... Uh, driven out of there, so I didn't get to get a word with him. But congratulations, Skeeter. Uh, kind of the season of rollovers continues, right? I mean, Jeff Spacek on the lid, right on the front stretch. You know, it's happened fast. Uh, you know, we've just seen so many rollovers this year. Zach Wallers, we talked a little bit about him on the first night. You know, he ended up making both features, but wow, he was, he was, we've, you know, we've called people the fly swatter on this show before, and and he was kind of all, I mean, he was making progress, but it was all kind of all over. You get a chance, go back and watch Dirt Race Central. Uh, Zach was pretty exciting. Didn't make other drivers happy, but uh, he was making his way to the front at all costs. Uh, you know, that late model melee that happened on the second night looks like Travis. If I went and watched the replay, I heard someone texted me today, left rear tire going down. And then Clex Glenn, sure enough, left rear tire. I mean, by the time the accident happened, it was almost off the rim. Uh, you know, he got into corners three and four, and that baby was almost flat. And he just, you know, got sideways and, and everyone just kind of bumped into him. And my last thought, Labor Day Monday, what we need to do is get a race. And I mentioned this to a couple of late model drivers like, no, 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 this is long enough. 
need to get a race in Brainerd or Bemidji. So the guys could just stay. They race Monday. They rest on Tuesday. They rest on Wednesday. Then you either go to the sites because you're already up north or and or Friday night, you go to the national. Just keep all the drivers up here. Everyone from Leclerc. We'll, you know, we'll get some of the Dirt Kings guys over next year. We just, you know, get another one. We'll Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Another challenge series race Monday. Like I said, the guys get two days off, hang around up north, and then keep racing. What do you guys think? Good idea. I think y'all got to get a job, right? Because <laughs> who is self-employed? He's like, I can work from anywhere. It don't matter. I can do it. Like, it's time Monday. <laughs> these drivers are going, man. This dude must never work, right? You got, you got. So they do have a race on Monday. That's it's in Madison, right? They and Cheyenne and Lisbon, but not up here. But uh, they got a whole week of racing the following week, of course, with the 100. That would be tough. Now remember, Brainerd already races, right? They have the Mighty Axe. They race that Saturday and Sunday. But I think honestly, by the time they get done with four long nights of racing, they're about ready to take. Oh. Over. They were they were very clear when I mentioned to them. They're like, I hope this happens. They're like, I don't, I don't, I don't. That's what they're <laughs> right. 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 Now, so, what did probably, you take out the show? Like to happen. I could use a couple more shows here. Uh, Bert, well, what's your thoughts on that? Did you watch any of Labor Day, Bert? I, I did not see any of the Labor Day shootout, but uh, I agree with you, Ryan. That would be a lot of racing, and I can see uh, um, drivers uh, not being receptive to that idea. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You know, I would have when I was racing. Now today, I'm like, I don't know how I did it. But, you know, I got some takeaways. First thing I want to take away is it was good to be back. I mean, I hadn't been up in Northern. That's the first time in Hibbing this year, first time in Proctor, I guess, in two years because they didn't race last year, you know, and, and Rapids. I was there at the NLRA show. So it was good to be back on the people, you know, got to hang out with Pete, of course, there at the Silver, got to see Dick Chrisman, got to talk to Billy Nelson. You know, and I saw a whole bunch of people that I don't normally see, you know, Mike Mackey and the Tardy group and all that. And it was in my family. So it was just great to be up there, you know, around that atmosphere. I mean, I've said it multiple times. It's like, man, I, I could sit and just watch pay-per-view all day long and be good. But it's still nice to get to the track because there's so many people. I mean, there are people that I've been around my whole life. So it's fun to be up and just kind of be around that. So that was great. I saw us. I saw so many people and a lot of people that follow the show. So tip of the cap to every single one of you. Thanks for our, thanks for the support. That was number one. You know, uh, Grand Rapids was going to be good. I was so pumped. I mean, with the moisture on the track, that was looking like it was going to be probably the race of the weekend. And it just didn't get to happen, which sucked. Proctor, I just love that place. Hibbing was, ah. Eh, just hard and dry you know it's it's for, for me it's frustrating i look at things i'm gonna ask you guys this so i look at things from a whole different viewpoint right as to what a fan would right because i raced so when i'm watching a race you know and i can have the person next to me that's never driven a lap and like man this is a good race and i could be like this dude's an idiot like it's one lane what is he talking about i'm like i'm all ready to lose my mind watching this race this race sucks and this guy's like is it do you have a different viewpoint as a fan that's never raced like on what makes a good race and what doesn't then maybe you know because when we were up in the booth book i was like okay watch what's going to happen after they farm it it's going to be one lane on the bottom it's going to move up to about a lane and a half for the next race the third race the mods will be the best race of the night and 10 laps into the late model feature it's going to lock down on the bottom and that is almost it, it was almost identical like i called every single i knew what was going to happen so for me, I was frustrated watching because I'm like, oh, this sucks. What was it? What was it like for you, kind of seeing all that? Well, I I can't say I was frustrated because I've been to 35 Labor Day shootouts or 30. You know, you kind of know what you're getting uh, when you step foot in the place a little bit. I will have to say, over the last, well, probably from the time that you and, and your dad and that group took over, there's been a lot more effort put in. I would say for most of the 90s, start at 2 o'clock, misting. I mean, they didn't tear anything up back then. You know what I mean? It was just mist and hope, mist and hope, mist and hope. So, uh, yeah, I just, I, I just think what they might have to do in the future is really look at that track – because I've heard if the banking is consistent, it's better than if you've got a little cup somewhere. Uh, because, you know, only 
half that track gets used all right. year long. You know, I mean, that very top, we talked about Rick Auckland in 1992 on the very, very, very lip of the top of that track. That's the last time anybody's used it, you know. Right. So I don't know if they need to just. Hey, Skeeter used it. Well, yeah, I guess Skeeter, Skeeter used it. That's how yeah. Skeeter won. He was yeah. good up there. So Skeeter, way up there. So just, to, Bert, what's your perspective? Like, I mean, do you think that you have a different perspective watching them than what maybe a former driver has? Probably. Um, I mean, I think some some general fans may just be looking for speed. You know, they just want to see the cars go fast. And, right. you know, if I see cars going fast, but there's no passing to me, that's really not exciting. But, you know, to a novice fan, that may be exciting. You know, I want to see um, at least cars, drivers challenging each other. You know, I don't want it just to be uh, follow the leader, whether it's riding the cushion or, you know, just staying down by by the bottom of the track um i want cars to be close to each other and challenging each other that's what i look for in a race right and there were some races that were like that there was just probably more that wasn't you know like the midwest mods put on some pretty good races the heats were really good probably the best race of the first night was was brady uton charging the high side battling with kelly Esty. that was fantastic that was a hell of a race and then in the feature of course Tyler Vernon, you know, proud sponsor of the show, Vernon Racing, first ever win, and he did a great job. And one thing I noticed is he had the presence of mind to, as the group kind of changed, he moved around on the racetrack kind of knowing where to be. So that was really smart. And Tyler Kittner, I was, you know, I'll be honest, I wanted Tyler Kittner to win. You know, he's racing for, you know, for the points, and he's, he's won everything at home. He got there. But the track was just starting to widen out. And I think if they would have maybe ran a B-man or two before that, we might have had a different outcome. So Tyler Vernon got it done. Now, funny story there. So, Bert, on the My Race Pass, they you, everybody puts your name in and you can enter whatever. So Kevin Eater drove Tyler Vernon's car in the Modified Division. So what's a nickname for Richard? Dick. Yep, yep. So he had his name as Richard Fitzwell. Okay. So Dick Fitzwell, right? Okay, that was his name. Fleischer, the announcer, was announcing it. He's like, number 40. I think that's Tyler Vernon or his car, but it says Richard Fitzwell. And he was totally confused. It was great. I was just and they're like, I, I talked to them. They're like, I think it would have been a little bit too obvious to put Dick Fitzwell. I'm like, I don't know. He had a lot going on up there. It might have slipped right past him. That would have been hilarious. So them guys cracked me up. Super stock feature, Shane Sabraski parked it in victory lane, closed the gap in Puka. I'm not sure if I told you this, but he won at Madison last night too. Oh, okay. So they're tied. And uh, Burdick had a shot to win, kind of faded back. And I would say the class of the field on the modified Skeeter ST, it's a little critical, not on him, but on the officiating because he jumped that heat, put him in position day one, but he schooled him on day two. Um, Sabraski was ducking underneath Belfi. It moved Belfi off the top, and Skeeter drove by both of them and was gone, and he just put an absolute ass kicking on him. And then Jay Kittner, he's got some Labor Day shootout wins, getting it done there, and you know, he said, hey, thanks to the track, it was kind of locked down. He did what he had to do, patience, experience. He knew what he had to do to win that race. Pat Doerr was impressive, though, 10th to second. You know, on a, he only had a handful of laps to do it. He, he yeah. was good all weekend. Kierstocks, Chad Finkbone, I think he locked up a national title. Chaston Finkbone got it done. This one's interesting. Top two DQ'd exhaust. The leader had his exhaust cut off in the middle of the car. The second place guy who was cut off literally just literally a couple inches from the back of the car. And he said, we cut, we all cut it off there. So if you get hit in the back bumper, it doesn't crush your exhaust. They DQ'd him. I think that deserves a donkey award right there to the officiating. I think he got a raw deal on that one. Chaston Finkbone, 13 years old, youngest driver to win a Labor Day shootout. But I want to give a special tip of the cap to Mark Tremberth. Uh, the official there, because like we said, there were some bad calls day one. Mike Belfi got a raw deal twice. I mean, it was bad, right? And and he recognized that. He's like, I'm a board member. I don't make calls. Everyone makes mistakes. He didn't, he didn't go ahead and just land lashes officials. He just says, hey, 
It happens. I think you got a raw deal. So they went ahead and paid his way in on day two. Said, you know, it doesn't make up for what you lost, but, you know, we appreciate you coming here. We'll cover your way in. You don't see that all the time. I think that's pretty cool when somebody says, hey, we were in the wrong because everybody, and yes, everybody, that includes this guy right here, right? We all make mistakes, and I probably made more than most, right? So we all do, but own it. Just own it. I mean, if you can own it, like Brandon Cop texted me, he says, hey, I deserve a donkey award for yard sale and hot car. He owned it. He knew that he did it. He wasn't, he wasn't trying to, like, make an excuse. Hey, I'll go for third I yard sale. I mean, it is what it is, you know? So own it, and I'm, I'm proud of Mark Tremberth. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put the bid out right now, Puka. Mark Tremberth for president of the Iron Range Racing Association 2022. Let's start the campaign. I think he's going to hate me forever. For Great doing. idea. So I love the idea. Let's do it. Any other uh, takeaways from the Labor Day shootout? That's pretty much it. And then Mark gave us a little donkey award because I, I kind of had the wrong oh, person. Yeah, for, yeah, for yeah. I, but I did. I, I thought I remember saying he won about three grand, I think, but it was 3,500 to win the first day, 4,500 to win the second day. So thanks for clearing that up, Mark. And thanks to the Iron Range Racing Association and you, Mark, for putting together a heck of a late model purse over two days. So Ryan and Puka, we got donkey words on that one. We actually did. All right. I guess we were a couple jackasses up in the booth. It is what it is. So so there was more invitationals. We'll touch on these quickly. The Big Buck Nationals, okay? Now, you can just say, did you guys see any results, any details, anything stick out? Okay, Big Buck Nationals, Aberdeen, South Dakota, Brown County Speedway. So Kent Arment won. Tyler Peterson won. Closed the gap a little bit on Shane Sebraski. Shane Brick drove by Trevor Nelson to win the super stocks, he don't lose out, right? And he drove by him. Now, I'm giving a huge donkey award to the, the, the whole group at the Brown County Speedway. Guys, you got to hear this, right? So they had a heat one day feature the next program, which to me already sucks, right? But listen to this. We're in a tire shortage. We're in a tire shortage, right? Everybody's having a hard time getting tires. Here was their format. Day one, double heats. Not only double heats, they had double heats with a non-paid dash. <laughs> so they had three races on day one. They took top eight out of the dash to put them in the feature. Everybody else had to run a B main. Run the next day. Oof. Yeah, run the next day. I'm like, and then they had you know the grudge matches, which was cool, right? Or whatever. But well, that's an awful lot of racing during a tire shortage for free. I mean, what are they thinking? Right? There was a lot of people going, they were pissed about that. So come on, guys. I mean, Kent, our man, if you're watching this, you've been racing for a long time. Come on, what do you think? Right? I mean, <laughs> what are I mean, what what is going through your mind with this format? I don't know if you had anything to do with the format or if that's Terry. I I don't know, but unbelievable that they would do that. And and their top two cars, well, one of them they wouldn't let come back, right? But Cole Searing and Chad Becker, they went the other direction. Chad Becker's from Aberdeen, and he didn't even race his hometown end of the year invitational. Crazy. If they would have had two complete shows, he was staying there. Yeah. Come on, right? So, so that was out in Aberdeen. The East West Clash out in Gillette. They had a triple header national title implications on the line. Cole Searing went out there. So did Becker. Cole Searing, three for three. He dominated. Oh, absolutely stomped him. Tony Liker in the Midwest mods wasn't even on the radar in the Midwest mod points. He got two first and two seconds. They had a makeup feature. Troy Liker got two first and two seconds. Tony Liker jumped into the lead. Kyle Jeanette, I was surprised to see this. A central Wisconsin guy. He went out there in the street stocks and he won all three races as well. And, and I had a conversation. I talked to Mike Nichols, who's a stud. This kid's got a pile of wins. I think he's got 12 wins, 12 seconds on the year. He's top, I think he's third or fourth in Minnesota points right now. He's like, Ryan, he goes, all we hear all the time is, oh, these these Wyoming people, right? They're not as good. He goes, the Liker boys are no joke. Like, they are absolutely legit. Like, and first class. He said, he goes, I never had so much fun. I needed to get away. It was fun to go out there. I got treated like just great Great racers, great ambassadors to the sport. So I just wanted to point that out. And then, so the national title race right now, Searing had a huge week. He spread spread the gap a little bit, right? Tyler Peterson. Remember I said that Sabraski kind of had a huge lead in the mod? 
Yeah, not no more. Not no more. <laughs> not no more. It's like 11 points. That's it. Like Tyler Peterson is right there. It's close. And uh, in the super stocks, Shane Sabrasky, Kevin Burdick are now tied going into the weekend. Tony Liker leads, but Rodine, Lucas Rodine, he got a, a pair of wins in a second. He's in striking distance. Parker Anderson, a huge lead. And I think Chad Finkbone sealed up the deal. Now, I got a question for both of you guys on the national points. I was looking at the national point standings for Wasota late models. And, and I don't mean any disrespect to anybody when I when I make these comments, okay? I don't. Like, I'm, I'm bold and I'll say what's on my mind, but just hear me out. Okay, here's your top five. Cole Searing, Chad Becker, Shane Edgerton, Derek Vessel, Jeffrey Massinger. Them are all five drivers that can go anywhere, compete, run well, win races. Devin Van Hulse, zero wins this year is sixth. He can run pretty good at home, but he's not Pat Bull, okay? David Carlson, Bryce Sward, Kurt Kranz, Dave Moss, who hasn't won since the beginning of June. Cody Martin's 11th, Cole Schill's 12th, Rich Thomas is 13th, okay? I'm just saying. There's only a couple drivers, like three or four, that even get 30 shows, right? They don't even sure. get the 30 shows. The Wissota late models, okay, so promoters, because I know some of you are listening, I, ha I have a solution to this. If you want to see a true representation of, Wis of Wissota late model racing, if you want the Wisconsin guys like Dor and Tanta and Redesky and them to have a shot at this deal, right, drop it down to the best 20. Drop it down to the best 20 shows. I would like to do some numbers on that to see what the national points would look like if it was only the best 20 shows. Because then you'd have you'd have more people that actually would be able to follow it. Because remember, in late model racing, it's not like there's a ton of shows anyway. It's not like Midwest Mods where you can get 70 if you want to. You can't do that, right? So I think that the late models need to bring it down to the best 20 shows to, to really put more people in the conversation for a national championship. What, what's your guys' thoughts as a fan's perspective? Go ahead, Bert. Well, I wouldn't necessarily disagree with that. Uh, I mean, one thing to consider, I mean, how many Wisconsin tracks actually have with soda late models, Menominee and superior and superior. I mean, so having only two tracks that race weekly that have with soda late models, <laughs> And they're on yeah, the same I mean, night. Oh, well, yeah, that even complicates things even more. Um, Wisconsin drivers have no no chance to, unless they want to travel, do a lot of traveling outside the state, they have no chance to, to be they, they up. The specials in there, right? They get, they get all the specials. They get the Challenge Series. They get the <clears throat> Bright Lake's got a few shows, and Ashland's got a couple shows. And, you but know, you're not going to get 30. You're not going to get 30, not a chance. No, right. No, right. No, for yeah, sure. Yeah, no, that's, that, that's really an interesting point. And fans, we've talked about a lot so far. To, you know, not only comment on the late model discussion here, but we've gone through a lot. So feel free to comment. I haven't thrown that out there yet. You know, something I was just thinking as you're talking about this. So let's look back 20 years ago when guys over on this side were winning national titles. Rice Lake raced late models weekly. Alex raced late models weekly. weekly. Fargo raced late models weekly. Peter Lake. Uh, Huron. I mean, here on, I mean, is, I know Miller's taking over. Cedar Lake. And Cedar Lake, yeah, used to be a Wazota track. So, yeah, it's, you know, there's a lot less late model racing kind of in the uh, heartland or, or the, what would you call it, kind of the founding area, kind of, the, you know, the of, of Wazota, kind of that, uh, uh, you know, the original track. So, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, bring that thing down to 20, and then then maybe you'll start seeing some, traveling i mean i know these guys travel for the challenge series but maybe then you know i remember a time around 2000 when door traveled all the way to gillette towards the end of the year because i think he had to race gelling or something like that way out there that would be pretty cool to see as a fan somebody coming two states over to try and catch capture that national title it wasn't sean or seymour they had all those tracks with was soda too but i was yeah, just gonna say when eastern wisconsin went with soda i think it was like 97 98 somewhere in there uh, Pete Parker won the Wasota yep. National Championship, yep. but he was racing three nights a week. Um, right. So, I mean, he was getting three shows every week. And, you know, when you have opportunities to race, you, then you can win. But 
if you only have one opportunity per week to race at a track that has Wasota National Points, you're not, you have no chance. Right. I was talking to Steve Larson and Canta both about that. And like, we can't even, we can't follow it. You know, Steve, um, John Canta is a former national champion and he's like, we, it's not even feasible. We can't even, we can't even do it. So I think they need to look at that and then also change that whole structure, go back to the old point system, the 35, 33, 32, 31 deal to where a three car feature win is not like way more valuable than a 50 car second. That, that's got to be looked at for sure, too. So that was it for the Labor Day weekend. I mean, there was several other specials in there. Follow the Power Ranking Show to get all of the details on there. But we got some invitationals coming up. We'll briefly touch on just a few of them coming up. The Northern Nationals up at the Gondic Law Speedway. They race Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Of course, Friday, Saturday, Puka, four classes, not eight, not seven, not six, right? Late mods, supers, Midwest mods. They got a few other classes the night before. Um, and then the John Sites Memorial, night one, the prelude to the Johnny, of course, Thursday night at the River City Speedway, the final NLRA points night of the year, Shane Edgington with an eight point edge on rookie Mike Bresseth, and then the 92 lap, 9,200 to win. That's a big show. I'm, I'm pumped for the sites. It's always a good race. Any quick predictions, anything on, on the sites, you know, what are you guys, what can you expect there? Um, well, have you been in uh, contact? Uh, now his name is, uh, I can't think of his name. Last year's winner. Yes, and yes, he's going. So Aaron okay, Turbo, right. who won it the last two years up in Canada, right, from Estevan, Saskatchewan, he is making the trip to try to make it three in a row and four in a row for Team Canada. Wow, very I interesting. Mean, oh, good. That would be, that'd be pretty awesome uh, if, if he would be able to uh, uh, win it again. Do you know yeah. how often he's raced this year? I think he only has one or two late model races, doesn't he? Okay. All right. That was, I know, I know last year he only had like four or five when he went right. to the site. So. Right. He's a, he's a wheel man, but boy, that's a tall task. To win that three in a row, that's, that would be monumental. Then, of course, we got, we'll have some coverage on the Boone Super Nationals. I'm sure you got some people from your area that are down in Boone so Bert can keep track of them. The IMCA Super Nationals is probably the biggest invitational or week-long deal of the year. Wasota 100, which is a week away, they got to they gotta take note. Guys, I, I looked at the contingencies for the winner from, I mean, just a big stack. I mean, they get lost. Can't even see the car. You see that picture huh? that was on Facebook? Yeah, and I commented on it. I take Wasota Promoters Association, right? <laughs> I said, was take note. So not only, right, you know, Skeeter Esty commented on there. He's like, yeah, we, I mean, we don't get no AFCO products. It's the AFCO race of champion. Like the drivers get nothing, right? You know, they get some extra money. They do. But the fact of the matter is there's just not, it doesn't seem like there's much effort put in as far as contingencies go to make the Wasota 100. And I'm giving a huge donkey award, guys, to the Wasota Promoters Association. Carson, Carson, listen to me. I got it. You, you got to quit doing dumb stuff. All right. All right. Dude, they are now they made it at the 100 this year that every single driver has to pay for their pit spot. It don't matter if you park out in the middle of absolute Back nowhere. Yep. You, it costs for the better pit spots. It costs more for the worst pit spots. It costs less. But that's just an added expense. Quit nickeling and diming the drivers. Stop it. Okay. Stop. You know, they're already doing stuff. They mandated tires for the Silver 1000. Pissed off a whole bunch of low-budget guys where they had to buy tires. Stupid. you got to start looking out for the racers. This pissed off a whole bunch of people. And I talked to drivers that said, just on principle alone, we're not going to the Wasota 100. I said, are you going to Cedar Lake? They said, we're probably not going anywhere. We'll probably just take it off. In fact, I talked to some drivers that said, we're going to skip that whole weekend. And we're now going to Kevin Eater. We're, he's got his bachelor party down uh, at Knoxville that weekend because the same weekend as Knoxville. He's sure. like, they're like, they're like, we're sick of paying all this nickel dime stuff. We're just gonna go down and drink a bunch of beer. I'm like, so there you go. You're losing drivers. It's just out of principle. They gotta quit it, you know. And then the Dirt Kings, you know, in, in uh, Bert's neck of the woods, the Discount Shop Tells Dirt Kings Tour, Anvil <laughs> with a slight edge on that deal. Wilmot and at Sycamore, which is my home track, but I'm not going to be there this weekend. And then 
the World 100. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So lots of racing. There's way more than that. Them are the big ones coming up, you know. And what do you think? What do you say, guys? Let's take a brief look back at the national scene from this past week, right? Should we talk late model racing first? Yeah, let's go with the Lucas. Let's go with the Lucas. Bert, did you watch any of that? I did not watch any of the Lucas. I watched some of the Outlaws and I watched some of the Mars races, but I did not watch Lucas, but I know one of my drivers did win this week. So oh, you kicked ass. You did. You really you, you kind of you did. You did. And there was really only one. There's a lot of rain out. So Lucas, they've been getting Mother Nature's been kicking the crap out of the Lucas series all year long. But they were over in Portsmouth. And uh Puka, why don't you just take it away? Give us a little recap on Portsmouth. Well, the biggest thing that you know, the, the racing was, you know, all right. I mean, right at the beginning there with T Mac Bronson and I think was it what it was it Hudson O'Neill? Yeah, uh, but T Mac. Saying it here, what is it, September 7th, T Mac is going to be your champion. Um, you know, when the chips are down, like a night like that, where he had to win just to keep maintaining. And like I said, he's been gaining points most weekends since I 80. He continues to gain. There was, uh, I think, Batesville, he went backward because that's when JD tried the double, double sliders on Hudson, got second. But so that's the only weekend since I 80 that he's lost points to JD. Uh, T Mac. He did what he had to do with a veteran, you know, won that race. And I think he's going to lock it up. Uh, you know, n- not that JD can't close, but I think it's basically T max to lose at this point, but I'm predicting he's going to take it home. How about you? Yeah, I agree. That was a pretty cool three wide power move. He took for the lead. I mean, yeah. it really was. Moran was there. Moran got, he was kind of in. Or was Moran. It wasn't Hudson. Yeah. It was Moran. Yeah. Moran, Moran was good. But a couple of things that stuck out early is uh, Matt Cosner had to miss because of COVID. And then Marlar wasn't there because his whole crew had COVID, right? He didn't have COVID. <laughs> they got hardship points. So two drivers affected by the whole COVID deal. I guess I thought that was done. But uh, the feature took over an hour. It's like an hour and five minutes. It was worse than the Superstock feature in Hibbing <laughs> that I thought took like forever. This was longer. I'm like, these guys are supposed to be professionals. What are you doing? So yeah, you're exactly right. Then we got the we had the Mars lates, right? So I guess we'll go World of Outlaw next. We can do that. You know, Bert, you said you watched a little World of Outlaw action. They had Cherokee on Thursday, the Rock Galt Memorial. Livonia raced on Friday, and then they had a race at Bulls Gap on Saturday. Anything stick out to you from over the weekend? Well, I watched Cherokee, and I watched Bulls Gap. And uh, Cherokee, the racing really wasn't that exciting. It was more of, a, you know, everybody uh, follow the leader on the bottom. But, I mean, you can – sometimes tracks like that uh, separate the men from the boys, and Overton proved why he is probably the driver of the year because he was actually able to go up a lane higher and make some passes, even though the very bottom was the preferred lane. Uh, Overton was able to get to the front by going up a little bit higher, and, you know, that's what kind of separates him from the rest of the field, um, you know, those are my thoughts on Cherokee. Yeah, <laughs> other than that, it was a one-lane train. It was pretty right. – you're right. He went up kind of in no man's land and drove around him. I'm like, wow, he's – I mean, he was really good. There was like 872 flat tires. Like, people, right rears were exploding. It started at the beginning. Bryce and Harper got a flat on the parade lap, and I'm like, okay, well, that's done. <laughs> and, like, the last, like, seven, eight, nine, ten laps, it's like everybody was getting flats. Second place, JD. Third place, Fergie. Both of them right rear flats. Josh Richards got a flat on the closing lap. I mean, that was Hoosier Tire won that race. So Overton won. Chris Madden got second. Puka, any thoughts on the, the Rock Gold Memorial? Well, I did. I was going to bring up a, a something on uh, Overton. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you guys a question, and I'm going to have some commentary, and I'll come back to the question. It gives also the listeners some time to think about this. So would you rather – if you're Brandon Overton, win all the money that is won this year, or the a points title like a World of Outlaw points title or a Lucas points title. A couple things on that. Obviously, the points title, your name's kind of engraved forever, right? You know, and I don't know if anybody does any any like you know past champ provisionals or anything really like that before. But you know, the money a person might re- forget two or three years from now, but your name on the trophy, so to speak, kind of stays forever. Now, with that being said. I ran some numbers over the weekend with Overton. Double Dreams, Dream Qualifiers, Carolina Sizzler, second at USA Nationals, Firecracker winner plus a prelim night, North-South winner plus a prelim night, Winter Nationals, the Galt Memorial, everything. 
just with that winnings when that second place at Cedar Lake, $478,000. So I think it's fair to say his winnings could easily get the 525,000 with seconds, thirds and everything else. You know what I mean? I, I don't think assuming if you go from 478 to, to 525, okay, 50, 50 more thousand dollars all year long in thirds, fourths, fifths. And I don't even necessarily have all of his wins probably because he'd had some of the Southern national stuff. If he wins every single race the rest of the year, double worlds, double world prelims, the Texas race, the dirt track world championship for hundred, the Pittsburgher. And these are just some of the big ones, the Jackson 100 for 20. There's the extreme dirt car stuff that'll fire up in the fall. If we assume he's already done 525, what I have down is another 477. He will go over a million dollars in earnings. He'd probably be the first one since the million dollar man himself. So again, with that being said, the million dollar year, which would be tough, he'd have to win everything or the points championship, whichever one of you are. Bert, why don't you take it away? What would you rather have? I'll take the money. <laughs> the cash. Tell me the money, huh? <laughs> money money is king um i mean i i see where i see where you're coming from with yeah his name will be engraved in the trophy forever and he'll be on a website listed as as a series champion uh but i think what he is doing is is just unbelievable and um you know i i think i think there's more excitement around him than there is on either of the of the major series points leaders right now. I mean, everybody wants to know where Overton is racing this weekend, you know, and I, I just think, um, you know, he's kind of back to the outlaw. You know, we always talk about Scott That's Lewis a good and Billy Moyer being that, being the outlaws and, you know, they kind of made a career out of that. And, you know, I think, you know, he's a throwback to that, to those days. That's a great point. So Ryan, would you rather points title or moolah? Both. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go with both. In a perfect world, right? And I don't know how the schedules align for everything, but in a perfect world, it'd be fun to look at whichever one of the two series coincided with all the big shows, and and win a championship and all the money, right? <laughs> if I had to choose one, it would be Penn. What's his What's his contract look like? Does he get a percentage? I mean, because if he's if he's I mean, he's not, I'm sure he's getting percentage, right? But if he's one of the racers out there going, I just want to race, you keep the money, you just take care of everything, then I for sure want the championship. But he's not that bad, right? When you're that good, you're gonna get paid. You're gonna get paid, right? So, man, with all the money that's on the line, that's the reason why the series are just there's I don't know, it just ain't good. How cool would it be though? Okay, I'm going to take this one step further. If they took all the crown jewels that are there, right, and somebody coordinated it all together to where there was a series of just crown jewels. They tried that, didn't it? Was it that NDRA or something? Bert, you probably remember. I don't know if you ever reported on There was something that was... There was, was like, a third series. Yeah. That, this, that was like six, seven years ago. Right. Yeah, they were we trying to, to do Maybe something. we'll be down to just one. Who knows how long World of Outlaws is going to be here with some of the stuff they're doing, right? But in a perfect world, if there was a series that was all crown jewels, that would be something. But if I had to choose one, <laughs> show me the money. Show yeah, me I, okay. the You're money. Broken. For sure. <laughs> For sure. So let's go to Friday. Well, how about you, Puka? Uh, same thing. I hear a money guy. I didn't have to ask that question. No, you're, you're... I, I think, like I said, I actually think I think I would do I would I would take the title. I think. Uh, really? Like I, yeah, I think like I said, just from the sake. Well, I, I'm going with the what you said. Like you know, like what do you say? Uh, old men die, kids lie for it. Old men die for it, or whatever. The attention yeah. part. Yeah. And like I said, you're you you're be there forever. I, I like I said, five and ten and fifteen years down the road him being a champion is going to be featured more than, well, this guy won $800,000 that one year. You know, that's going to kind of fade. I think, I, I don't know, if but he, you know, like, if you were to able, if you were able to surpass a million, well, that would be, oh, yeah. then, yeah, that then be, I agree. Yeah. If he yeah, can win the rest of the way, right. he can win the, like I said, he might not have to win all that. His earnings might be, like I said, 
I just do a rough estimate and come in about 525. It might be 550, 575. Then he doesn't have to win all of those races. And then his XR, is there some sort of a bonus yeah. for Bristol? So yeah. I'm not even including that either. And remember that deal at, at Vegas, right? The duel in the desert, it's double pay. If you hit all three shows, it you get it's double payout for it because that's the third of the series. So it's right. fifty grand to win, but it's actually a hundred grand to win if you raced all three. Shows. Okay, and he's going to do that. So there you go. So like I said, there's some of this stuff. So we, I'm going to keep the math going on this, and we'll report back. Uh, and in the Gateway Dirt Nationals, I didn't mention that. You know, he has that. So he's got. We we'll have to report back this the week of Christmas. Really, we're not going to know to the yeah. end how he does. Yeah. So Brandon Overton, get after it, million dollar man, <laughs> take two. Let's get her done. So Livonia ran on Friday. Bert, you didn't watch that one. Literally Correct. top to bottom. So Puka, we're critical about track prep at some of our tracks. I'm here yeah. to tell you that the Hibbing Raceway was like the best track on planet Earth compared to Livonia. This yeah. place was straight marbles. The whole place, just a dust bowl. Jeff, our late model guy, says, hey, did you see any of the uh, recap or see any of the highlights from Livonia? I'm like, no. He goes, yeah, me neither. It was too dusty. So I'm like, <laughs> yeah, fair enough. So, But here's the deal. Ben Watkins. A local guy parked it in Victory Lane. Yeah. Tyler Bruning was there, but a local guy, it's just too bad nobody saw it, right? It's just too bad, <laughs> you know? So that just is what it is. Now, Saturday at Bulls Gap, I got a lot to say about this one. I got a lot to say about this one. I do. So, Bert, Bert and Puka, why don't you guys go ahead and start, you know, give me your thoughts. And then I got, I, I, yeah. Uh, there's a, well, I'll, 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 I'll let Puka and, go first. Well, I'm just going to start for 10 seconds and you can kind of set the stage for everyone, Bert, but a lot of problems getting this race started. And you can go ahead and, and give them some context, Bert. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. I mean, there was a, uh, um, Madden was on the pole and Weiss was set. Well, first there was a caution and then, uh, so they restarted the race and then, uh, Weiss got into the back of Madden coming out of four before they even took the green flag and what, did uh, you they see were, there? what was your thoughts on that incident well when puka i think it was puka that sent the video to us and when i first watched that i thought well i get and you know i thought uh it was weiss's fault i mean weiss got into the back of madden uh, but now seeing um the whole picture uh, the first start and everything. Um, and, you know, I never raced before, so I'm sure you have a, you have a pretty good opinion as to what happened. Um, but yeah, I mean, Madden may have been playing games on the start and um, that's what actually caused everything. So the initial start <clears throat> Madden's on the pole, Dale McDowell was second inside. Okay. Dale McDowell on the initial okay. start, they come into three and four. Jackrabbit start. Madden kind of hits the brake, slows up, and and McDonald kind of went down. Yeah, like yeah. he's like, so he didn't run into him. They call him for jump. So I'm like, hmm. so they put him back row. They put Weiss in second. Second start. Jackrabbit start again. Everybody stacks up. B1 bomber. Nowhere to go. Gets caught up in the deal. His night's done because of that. <laughs> Third try. Same thing. He does that jackrabbit start. He literally is rolling, hits the brakes. To, he's trying to get the car loaded up, but it's both shutting the car down. Everybody stacks up. Weiss gets into him. Weiss gets pushed into him. They get hooked, right? Now, at this point here, like after the first one, I've seen officials literally look like your jackrabbit start. You're going to the back. Madden gets out of his car, which I don't know if the officials told him to get out because they were hooked. Or if he just got out, I thought when he got out, you go to the back and you're done. Evidently not, because he's a local boy, right? So he gets out of his car. He goes right over in Ricky Weiss's grill. He starts screaming at Ricky Weiss, his arms flailing, this and that. It's like, look, jackass, this was your fault. Like, what are you doing? You're dynamiting the brakes in front of the whole field. This is all 100% Chris Madden. Now. I have a challenge. So first of all, don't give a word to Chris Madden because he's had like the little kid meltdown all year long, multiple times. Like he, he just over and over. And this was all 100% his own doing. He literally caused three back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back restarts because of his stupid, stupid starts. Okay. Now 
I got a hundred dollar bill of my own money for the first driver, right? That when he comes over to you throwing a temper tantrum, you punch him square in the face. <laughs> like first person to do that, I got a hundred dollar bill from Ryan Aho at the one to go show because he's out of control. He throw he runs into everything. He's he's not a clean driver. He's dirty. He smashes into everything. And the first time somebody bumps into him, he's over yelling at him and flailing and acting like no, no, act like a champion. And and I've heard this about him, and that's why he's bouncing around ride to ride to ride to ride. He's got an attitude problem. He's a good racer, but somebody and he looks pretty tough. I know he whooped my ass probably, but I you know, there's there's bigger guys than me. I'd like to see him do that to like uh Mark Whitener or Kyle Bronson or, oh, or yeah. somebody like that, right? So it's got to be somebody a whole lot tougher than this guy, right? But don't, if you don't, don't jackrabbit start, right? I've seen people get called on that. How, and that's where, like, I don't know what the officials are watching there. You know, like, how can they not, how can they not just talk to them and say, you got to get this right? Now, with that said, b went on to win this one. Madden got second. Michael Chilton got third. He was really good. But and Weiss, who's been struggling, he was on the podium. He was in a third place finish, and he broke. I think he got a flat tire. So, what is your guys' thoughts about this Jack Rabbit start stuff? I mean, when you see that causes yellows, I mean, what goes through your mind? I just want to say, Puka, do we need to put the disclaimer? The views expressed here are not those of the one to go show. <laughs> yeah, we're going to check with legal after this. You know, there might be a lot of beep, beep, beep. Uh, no. Uh, you know, I'll go first on this one, but, uh, yeah. you know, I, you know, I don't know enough to know about the Jackrabbit start because I haven't raised, but I will say this, feel free to comment everyone. And this is on our TikTok and on our Snapchat. <laughs> Put some of this video up there where you can see Madden having a complete melt of, and I'll try to get it up here in our YouTube page and, and Facebook page real soon here, but I think it's already up on, on the, uh, TikTok and, and you, or, uh, uh, TikTok and Snapchat. I know it is. So go ahead, Bert, your thought, like I said, I just don't know enough. Like I said, loading the car, I would have never really known what that is um being just a fan well see i i didn't know about the first start with mcdowell because see i watched the highlights on dirt on dirt and i don't think that start was i'll have to go back and watch and see see if that start was on the video and see also watching i i'm finding out watching the highlights on dirt on dirt they cut a lot of stuff out because i I was watching the highlights and I was waiting for Madden to get out of the car, but that was all cut out. So I thought, well, maybe it was after the race was over. Uh, but you're saying it was during a, during a caution that that That's happened. That's why the right? one to go show is better than dirt on dirt. Dirt on dirt, they're <laughs> all soft. They're soft. They are. They are. They, they, they're, they're all like, they're all like butt kissers. They are. I had nothing, whatever, nothing against them. That's their deal. But none of them people at the dirt on dirt. They don't want to make any waves. I we're we're not afraid to say it how it is, and so you'll have to jump on to Dirt Vision and watch the full replay and actually catch because it shows all of it on Dirt Vision. Okay, it, you'll have to you'll have to check it out on there. We'll we'll show a little bit. So yeah, the Jackrabbit start. I don't know if he was messing with the guys behind him trying to load the. I think you're just trying to load the car, but man, I mean, you just I mean that's wrecking people and. Brent Larson can't be happy with them. Ricky Weiss can't be happy with them. Um, who won it last year? Um, Zach Mitchell. He got wrecked in that deal. He has yeah. to be pissed off. I mean, he wrecked a whole lot of race cars for no reason. It's a first lap. I mean, quit being a bonehead, you know? Well, and when I was watching that, um, when Weiss got into the into him, and then, I, and then on the next start – I saw Madden and Weiss in their spots back, and I'm thinking, how did they get their spots back? But so then I went back and watched it, and they did keep going. But yeah, there's a huge melee behind them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah well, they, in any altercation on the first start, when there's multiple cars involved, they all get their spot back. That's a world. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, and like so, McDowell, he hit the gas. I mean, he was gone because he didn't want to get banged from behind when that, that original one. You know, he was he got like I said he went down. He gassed it. He was out of there. Yeah. He did. Yeah. So that was it on the world of outlaws. You know, let's get into some, you know, we ain't going to get into too much Mars lates. They're, uh, they ran at farmer city squirrel. Brian Shirley got by McKay winger, McKay winger on both these shows, farmer city and falls. He got second. He looked really, really good this past weekend, but probably the race of the weekend in my eyes, Fairberry was unbelievable. Um, Pierce, 
early in that race, did you guys see him power chop Tanner English? <laughs> yeah, I, I watched because earlier in the week, I, well, after that happened, um, I saw Tanner English post on Facebook that, uh, you know, he was involved in an incident and it's tough to race. It's tough to give respect to drivers when they don't give you respect back. But then I watched the race and I didn't think it was that bad. What made it look, what made it look bad was their fenders got hooked. Right. Because right. I, I think if, if their fenders don't get hooked, they just bounce off of each other and they both keep going. But the fact that uh, English's front fender kind of got caught underneath the rear quarter of Pierce's, that's what caused him to spin out. Right. And that's another no-fault caution rule right there. Pierce really should have gone to the – if if there was judgment call on that, he came down, he should have gone to the back. It is what it is. But what a race at the end of it with McKay Winger and, and Pierce chucking sliders. I mean, this was – Probably the best race I saw all year at Fairbury because the ones that we watched haven't been quite as good as they were last year, in my opinion. But this one was absolutely unreal. Ten grand to win there. Bobby Pierce put on a hell of a show. And then they had the Baltus Classic at Eldora, kind of like a little <laughs> precursor there. And uh, Spencer Hughes, he parked in victory lane. He was really fast. Huddy got second. Uh, and uh, Winger, Ashton Winger got third. RTJ was going to win that race in Blue <laughs> Blew so, up, yeah. Yeah, so that, that's kind of like the prelude here coming into what's coming up this weekend. So, I so where, where did you guys see the Mars race? Where, where, who broadcast that? That was on well, I, uh, Flow. I watched oh, well, the Flow. Oh, okay. And I watched the highlights on Dirt on Dirt. Uh, it, oh. it, that's where I watched it. Um, and they had, okay. they, they have every, they don't, they didn't cut stuff out. Um, um, and I just want to make one comment about Pierce. I mean, What's amazing to me about Bobby Pierce is when the race is on the line, he seems to have another gear. I'm not saying he ha actually has another gear, but I mean, he drives it so much harder when the race is on the line and he makes that car work. I mean, it's just amazing. Yeah, he's good. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good. So World of All Lost Sprints, the racing was good. I don't know that it was exceptional. Nothing. I mean, um, J Mac won, Sweet won, Macedo won. Donnie Schatz had a pretty solid weekend, four second, fourth, and a six. Grace Harbor, Logan Schuhart got the win last night. Brad Sweet still got a pretty commanding point lead. No real drama or storylines in the world of outlaw. They are going this weekend to Chico, California, the Silver Dollar Speedway. And I'm like, why don't I remember that name? That was one of the tracks on the PlayStation game, right? World of Outlaw Racing. So that was that little bull ring on there. So I'm like, I've raced there before. Like many, many, many times from the comfort of my own couch, right? So, so well, we're going back to Brad Sweet's home territory there. So, uh, look, you know, look for a big weekend from him and Schuhart, you know, 25 race drought, hadn't won since Minnesota since the Jackson Nationals. So, uh, you know, kind of, and even McFadden, you know, getting back, you know, he's been kind of good since uh, the, the uh, Kings Royal. And that, remember that hard wreck a week ago at Black Hills where he, remember he rolled hard, something popped a tire or something coming in there. So kind of nice to see him rebound the way he did. Absolutely. So what do you say we get into some who's hot, who's not brought to you, Puka, by our friends at? Over at Blue Line Brews right here. Awesome mugs, bluelinebrews.com. You can get one of these. And I'll tell you what, you put ice in these things and five hours later, there's still ice in these things. It's unbelievable. But uh, we've talked about them before. Great copy, bluelinebrews.com. Type it in or just scroll down, go to the show links, click over. 10% of the profits made by Blue Line Brews. Goes back to families who've had the unfortunate incident of losing a family member in the line of duty. So Blue Line Brews is in the in the game of taking care of those families. Uh, you know, they're real excited to be associated with the One to Go show because they know that race fans respect law enforcement and they're big into the men and women in blue. So again, Blue Line Brews, great copy. And, and we're going to be actually, if you're up north, we're going to be at Grand Rapids this weekend, do a little taste testing at the Enduro on Friday night. So if you want a little taste test of the brews, uh, come on and see us at the Garden Rapids Speedway and uh, during the Enduro, and we'll take care of you. So, Bert, who do you got? Who's hot? <laughs> well, I really didn't put a list together, but obviously, uh, I mean, we talked about him a lot on the show already. Brandon Overton, um, you know, winning at Cherokee and, you know, uh, driving in areas of the track that no other driver will drive in. So I, I would still put him at the top of my list. 
Big sexy on the top of Burke's list. Puka, who do you got? Well, Bishop, you know, another win. You know, he's been real consistent over the last six weeks or so. We don't talk about him a lot. It just seems like with the talent level, maybe just a little bit down at the World of Outlaws, but he is really starting to put it together. It's not the superstar year he had last year, but, he, you know, by any other, you know, anyone else is winning these this many races, you know, they're going to call it an all-star year. Pat Doerr. Top five in Proctor, a second and third at the Labor Day shootout. Remains just this close to winning. Just needs to get over the hump just a little bit. And we already talked about Skeeter Esty, you know, pulling off uh, the double wins there at the Labor Day shootout. You know, pretty impressive. What do you got, Ryan? I got Tyler Peterson, the one TPO. Literally a week ago today, I said, man, the mod deal's over. Shane Sebraski can't be caught. I mean, he's got a huge lead, and he rattles off a second where he should have won. He got put to the back, guys, at Watertown. A little questionable. A little questionable there. He got put to the back, and he came from dead last to second. So that was impressive. Then he got a pair of wins, and he is in striking distance of the 7A. He has a real chance now to win the national title. Cole Searing, ever since he got booted, a weekend sweep. He's been absolutely on fire. It's not mathematically done yet, but it's as close to mathematically done as you can possibly get. And then Tony Liker, who went from not even on the radar in the points, he was on our radar. He's been number one in the power rankings a bunch, but two wins, two seconds. He's a national point leader, slight edge over Lucas Rodin. So, Bert, who's not? You got any who's not? Well, before I get to who's not, let me just add, uh, I would, uh, for who's hot, I would say Nick Avalink. I'll, um, Another podium finish. Uh, it'll be interesting to see this upcoming weekend when they go down to Sycamore. I'm, I'm assuming he's going mm -hmm. to Sycamore and Wilmont. Um, and then I, I need to give a shout out to uh, to uh, Travis Van Stratton. Uh, he races an IMSA stock car. And I should have looked this up before the show, but I think he won like his seventh straight track championship at Shano Speedway in the IMSA, mod or, uh, IMSA stock car division. Um, it's just and it's not like there's no competition in that division. Um, it, he went, I mean, he wins a lot of races. Don't get me wrong, but how he wins his championships is he's always there at the end of the feature. He does not have a DNF. I mean, anybody who races at Shano, if you have one DNF during the year, you're not going to win the championship because Travis Van Stratton has zero throughout the entire year. It, it's just crazy. Uh, you know how he can finish every feature um so shout out to him in order to finish first you must first finish <laughs> yeah, somewhere. very true very true so who, so who do you got on who's not you got any on the who's not side um let's just go with uh madden just because of his temper <laughs> <laughs> i mean we've talked about his temper several times this year so uh I'll throw him on the who's not because of that, even though he did get second in the race. All right, right. Puka, who do you got? Well, I got Mike Anderson in the mods from down in Jim Falls. You come up for the three days, 11th at the Labor Day shootout, didn't make the show one night, and 11th at the Silver. Brian, we've been around a long time. We know Mike Anderson's won a lot of races, so just, just pretty cold there. A local guy, and maybe not so much cold, but guy I think I just had higher expectations for going into the weekend because he's a regular Danny Vang. So an 11th and a 17th at the Labor Day shootout, a 9th at the Silver. So not like super ice cold, but like I said, with his experience here, maybe I was just expecting a little bit more. And then Kevin Burdick, you know, he was there, but it's, you know, he's, you know, podiums. But, man, you I know it's got to be disappointing for him and his team that, you no know, he did on the weekend. No podiums. Oh, no podiums? What happened on he got, he got, Friday? He got fourth. Both oh, nights. yeah, because. I was thinking because Terrence finished. That's right. Because yep. I was thinking yep. at the time. So I'm start, that's who I'm starting with. I got Kevin Burdick. He had a pair of fourths, and he needed to win. These are his home track invitationals. Right. He needed to create a little bit of a separation between him and the 7A. This weekend, I don't know where he's going, but I know Thursday they can race at Wilmer, right? Friday, Saturday is Superior. I know he'll be there. Sunday's Madison. There's four possible shows. Two of them are kind of in driving distance of the 7A. They're tied for the national championship. He had the nice lead coming in. That lead is gone. So Burdick on the chopping block. Chad Becker. If it can go wrong, it will go wrong. I'm not saying all self-inflicted type stuff. He had hauler issues, right? 
He blew a motor out in Gillette. He had multiple DNFs that kind of just got caught up in stuff. I got a question. Do they call that karma? Is that what that's called? <laughs> karma? Okay. Nothing against Chad. Not He didn't make the call, right? In fact, he wasn't even involved in the argument in Aberdeen. But is it one of them things where there's a higher power looking down going, man, I wonder if we really should have kicked out Cole Searing for two weeks. And now he got kicked out for two weeks. He comes back and all this bad luck is kind of like Chad Becker's two-week suspension. I'm not really sure. I'm just saying. Okay. And the 7A, Shane Sabraski. Okay. Like I said, I literally thought it was over. I thought it was over. I thought there's no way. There's no way Tyler Peterson can catch him. In his last five, he got a seven, two DNFs. Then he got second at Labor Day. Now, remember, he was inside Bell 5 for the lead, and Skeeter Esty kind of made them both look bad. I mean, he, Sabraski moved down Bell 5, Skeeter went by him. So, second still good. And he got second at Madison. So, people are like, well, second ain't bad. Well, the TPO drove by him from seventh and put a straightaway on him. Okay. Oh. That ain't good. Okay. <laughs> that plays on your psyche. When that guy's chasing you down for national points and literally gives you an ass kicking by a straightaway, you start overthinking stuff a little bit. So Sabraski in a little bit of trouble right now in the 7A modified, even though he's looking really good in the super. So our picks from last week, guys, okay? Keith got one. Pete got one. Puka got one. I got one. <laughs> Jeff Got zero. Jeff is the one who came up with the rules, by the way, of a different guy each night. And had he not done with those rules, he probably would have had some rights. So, Jeff, you cut your own throat. <laughs> this Bert guy, he got three. Unbelievable. Three. That I'm a little nervous, right? Because I feel like Sebraska got this guy chasing me down. I'm at 23. Bert's at 22. And uh, well, Jeff, we got to check Bert's chip. Yeah. Wow. I, He's, I, think I, got, I got three, and I had Glenn's who was charging in that one race. And yeah. then in the sprint cars, the second, the last two races, I picked the winners, but in the wrong races. Flipped them, <laughs> flipped them, yeah. So he, he's a little bit more on it than what we are. I only got one, so I'm only, I only got a one-point lead right now. But this week, okay, if you had to pick one, just, just one pick, Who's kind of your lock of the week this week? Superman will win a one of the World 100 races this week. I got Jesse Glenn's at the sites. Going to finally take her home up there. Jesse Glenn's at the sites. I got Pat Knorr at the Northern Nationals. He's been second, 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 third, second, third, third, second, second. And he's a bad man. Pat Doerr going to win the Northern Nationals in the Double One Express. We're going to pick both races at Chico. We're going to pick both of the big races for the World 100. We're picking the Sites Memorial, the 9200 to win. We're picking the, the Northern Nationals both days for the late model. So we got a handful of picks here this weekend. It'll be interesting. And uh, kind of had to put my homework together here. Hopefully I, <laughs> I need to stretch out a little bit here, feeling a little nervous. So let's get to the last lap, guys. Brought to you by our friends over at Zuli Race Engines. And a little shout out here, you know, Justin Vogel, who I've kind of been picking on, saying, man, pink's a nice color for a number. Bridesmaid's dress, too. He has the most second place finishes, but he got two wins this weekend. One in North Dakota, one in Minnesota. Parker Anderson got his 31st of the year. Aaron Blacklance with a win in Minnesota. Billy Christ, he won the Big Buck Nationals in Aberdeen. Andy Rosso with a win. So, we're an invitational time. Zuli Race Engines staying red hot, continue to win. You know, get a hold of Frank. He does a great job. A lot of great service. A lot of drivers have a lot of good things to say about him. If you need stuff fresh and rebuilt or just need new stuff, get a hold of him. He'll take care of you. So, what do you, what's, uh, what's this rumor I heard, Bert? You, you mentioned here on Earl Pearson Jr. Yeah. Um, after this past weekend, uh, him and his, uh, race team have well race the owner of the team have parted ways and uh, my understanding is that Earl Pearson Jr. will be following the rest of the Lucas tour in cars um, from Jason Pappage 
and um, the car owner uh, that own uh, Earl Pearson Jr.'s cars uh, will race in select races yet this year, and they'll pick a different driver and follow a tour next year is okay. my Did understanding. they say what tour are they kind of waiting to see on that? I can't remember if it said Lucas or not. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if they said a specific tour or not, but okay. they do plan to tour again. Okay, okay. Um, Puka, anything else that you want to add here from the past week's racing, upcoming racing? You know, anything that you want to add to the last lap? Well, well maybe just a question for Bert since he's a Wisconsin guy. So, Bert, would you rather Northern Nationals or Sites Memorial? Oh, I'd like to go to the site someday. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> um, I wasn't sure I, what it was going to think of how we'd answer that. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, I watched, um, um, some of the highlights from last year and stuff. And that looks like a fun track, uh, to watch a race at. And, uh, you know, I, I did a story about Turnbull, uh, winning last year and, uh, you know, just, uh, the excitement that, uh, you know, he had went talking about racing at that track. Uh, I'd like to go there someday. <clears throat> How about you, Ryan? Anything else in the last lap? Yeah, I did a little recap here from Sycamore Speedway. You got to talk about the team, right? Got to talk about the team. Dave Dolchak, <laughs> he got another second. He got hung out to dry on the bottom. I talked to him, put it up on the high side, elbows up, drove to the front, chased down the leader, had a shot at the end. Still got a pretty nice little point lead over there. No point races this weekend. I got to give a donkey award out, though. Um, his cousin, Brian, right? His gas man, I don't know who that is. I don't know if that's him or if he's, I don't know if he pays a guy. I know he's got to pay an employee, but remember a couple weeks ago, he ran out of gas in the feature. He was having his best ever run in the feature inside the top five and fourth sound. Dave said he was really like, sounded like he was doing good. Ran out of gas again. How the hell does that happen? Fire your gas guy. You got to find nope. the donkey award to Brian's gas guy. He's got to be done. That's twice in the last three weeks that they ran out of gas. I've never heard of such a thing in my entire life. So, with that said, check out the power rankings. Um, they're coming up. I'm fired up. National title implications on the line. Lots of stuff. The Dirt Kings coming out of the wire. The final light for the NLRA. Bert, what are your plans this weekend? Um, my plan, racing plans actually start tomorrow. I am going to sit in my recliner and watch the World 100 uh, preliminary night. Um and actually, my plans for probably the next four nights is to sit in my recliner and watch the World 100 stuff. There you go. So, our, of course, our must-see events of the week here. Puka brought to you by... Yeah, our fine friends over at l &M Radiator, right in Hibbing, Minnesota. So many of you experienced the Labor Day shootout this weekend. You got to tour around Hibbing. You got to tour around Chisholm. You got to kind of see the area. If you kind of like what you saw and you'd like to stick around a little bit longer... Masabi.com, M-E-S-A-B-I, again, down in the show notes, M-E-S-A-B-I, Masabi.com. They're looking for about 30 people, uh, two-year college, four-year college, high school degree, two-year tech school. They, they're looking for everything. And if they said, they said, if we if we don't like you over in this area, we'll train you, train you to be over in this area. So a lot of jobs, like I said, a mile, the plant is like, like I said, Ryan, I said, less than a mile from the Hibbing Racing they're Raceway, the Dunlanger Ford, Grand Rapids Motor Speedway is about 30 miles away. You get your two nights of racing, plus you can head to the Twin Ports, Louis Superior, Proctor, if you need to get more. So check out Masabi.com, LNM Radiator. We know they're a good family-owned business. They've been around a long time, so you can start a great career there ASAP. Absolutely. So, Bert, obviously the World 100 is on the radar, right? That's that's the big one. You know, it sounds yes. like uh, Kyle Larson's going to run the first one, not the second one. That's from uh, – little intel there from uh, Jeff. He mentioned that. Any other races sticking out to you this weekend that you're pretty fired up to see? Anything else stick out? Um, well, I mean, like I said, obviously, World 100 is uh, top of my list. Um, you know, this is the first year in several years that I'm not going down there. But some, some things are happening in my life that just kind of <laughs> is good. I'm not going to be able to get down there. Um, but obviously, Boone, the Super Nationals in, at Boone, uh, Super Nationals are like the Super Bowl for some of the Northeastern Wisconsin drivers. I mean, they they go down there every year. And, you know, actually, there's been I can think of at least three Northeast Wisconsin drivers who have won 
features in the past. And actually last year, I mean, we talked about it on the show, uh, Jared Seifert probably should have won the stock car feature, uh, but was taken out with only a couple of laps remaining. And he's back down there again in a stock car trying to uh, do it again. Um, my understanding is that uh, Jaden Schmidt, who races a IMCA Sport Mod, um, qualified for the main event last night already. Um, he, he, from my understanding is he went through a B feature, started 22nd and got up to, got up to fourth or so. It was one position out of the big show. Uh, but one of the drivers ahead of him got disqualified. So that put him in the big show. Um, and then number they three, at that one, that's, for sure. <laughs> oh yeah, they check it like crazy at that one. So I'll, I'll be trying to keep tabs on the Northeast Wisconsin drivers who are racing at Boone. And then number three, I have uh, the two Dirt King races. Um, for the first time ever, they will be racing outside of the state of Wisconsin uh, when they go to Sycamore uh, th this coming weekend. And since they're already down in Illinois, um, they'll be racing at Wilmont also, which is right by the Illinois border. So uh, uh, it should be interesting uh, to see. It, it's a pretty good points battle for the for the top spot. So this weekend is going to go a long ways in determining who the champion is because I think they only have one more race yet, and that would be Seymour the following weekend. Yeah, it's tight. It's tight. Puka, how about you? Uh, number one, what are your must-see events of the week, and what are your plans? Yeah, I must see the World 100. And remember, race fans, it starts Wednesday night. So most likely we're going to get to try to get this posted at least on Wednesday. So it starts tonight because you got the two. Uh, and remember to keep your eye on the split. The pot starts at 40 or 50,000. Remember, if you're gambling, you really have to get your gamble on. If you just get to the state of Ohio, you can buy a ticket online. But you have to be in the state because it's the state gambling rules. So if you want to pay a lot of tolls, right, Ryan, in Illinois and get there, feel free. But you got your shot at, at you know, at a big pot and It'll be interesting to see what the second night, uh, you know, what transpires there as far as the split the pot. Of course, we already talked about the Scythe Memorial, a big one that's been on the list for many years. And then, of course, the Northern Nationals, a show that, you know, I've been to many times, a lot of tradition. There. And then one of the, back to the DTR days, that was DTRA days. That was kind of fun where they'd race up to, to Grand Forks and run the thing on Friday. And then it all run down Saturday because it used to be, remember, sprint cars on Fridays, late models on Saturday. Uh, you know, I, I kind of miss that caravan-ish, you know, I mean, like I said, especially now the last, what, five or so years with the, because they didn't used to not have the prelude to the Johnny, and now they've had that for the last handful of years, so it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday up there, uh, but yeah, those are kind of what I've got my my uh, eyes and ears on. What am I up to? I said, Friday, I'm going to do the Enduro here in, in Grand Rapids. Saturday's up in the air, if I go anywhere, it'll be the Northern Nationals. But like you said, there's a lot to watch online with the sites, the Northern Nationals, the World 100. We'll just kind of see how it goes. Now, 78 degrees is what they're saying right now for the weather in Superior on Friday. And the weather can be very dicey <laughs> this time of year along Lake Superior. But yeah, right now, I didn't see Saturdays, but Friday night, beautiful weather, 80 degrees down there. So if there's a year to go, this is the year. I was going to say, that'd be the first time in the history of the Northern Nationals that that's happened, right? Yeah. So the Northern Nationals is number one for me. Don't get me wrong. I love the site, but national title implications on the line, right? Oh. They got the national point battle in the mod, in the in the super stock. I don't know where the Midwest mod guys are going to be. I know Likers will be in Rapid City. I know that Rodine's going to be at the site. I guess I don't know that he's going to be at the sites. I would assume maybe, but... The, the Northern Nationals was my stomping ground, one of my home tracks. I'm looking forward to that. Of course, the Sites Memorial, the, the 9200 to win race, honestly, I'm looking forward to that, but I think I might be looking forward to the prelude to the Johnny a little more, just because that points guy in me, right? You know, when you got an eight-point battle between first and second for the NLRA title with a rookie, and then, of course, with Edgington there, that interests me because that's a tough one because you got all these people coming in. It's not a typical NLRA race. You're going to have 50 late models there. You might not make the show, right? So, I mean, that's a different deal. So, I'm, I'm excited over the whole site. So, World 100, I mean, who's not? I mean, that's the – even though sometimes I'm like, oh, I don't know about half-mile racing, it's the World 100. It okay. is literally the late model race that every late model guy dreams of. It's the World 100, and then 
the world of outlaw sprints at chico that little bull ring that's got to be fun too hopefully there's some sliders and some action down there lots of races what, i what? uh i don't think i can say what i am doing um i i got it's, it's on the dl you're gonna have to stay tuned you're gonna mm. find out but i i've been kind of sworn to secrecy on what my plans are here for the upcoming week i will be at a couple races um oh but I, but I have been informed to not say where i'm going until i end up there um okay. and, uh, so people will understand why in just a little bit but we're just gonna keep it at that i'll be at a couple races this weekend though i will be and uh by the way guys i'm announcing at the autumn classic in watertown again so i'm excited to get over there with my buddy dave nermy we're gonna sit up in the booth and we're going to banter back and forth at the bad bull ring over there in South Dakota. So I'm fired up and thankful to the good family for um, inviting me over there. So pretty excited for that, but Hey, episode 96 in the books, we got 97, 98, 99 and 100. We are four away <laughs> from number 100. I'll tell you what guys, it's been a blast. It's been fun. Bert, it's great to have you back. It's great to oh, have a <laughs> Rio here. So that that's been good. And, uh, Guys, uh, we'll just turn it over to you, Puka. Bring us home. Yeah, yeah. One final comment too. Thinking you know, of the sites, I talked to Mike Stearns, which was great to have him up in the area, all the way from Hecla, South Dakota. So I talked to him. So remember, the mods will be racing up at the sites. I'm assuming is that where we're going to see TPO then? Would you, I would you... assume if 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 I were Tyler Peterson, if I were him, I'd be at Wilmer on Thursday, Grand Forks Friday and Saturday, right? And then I would obviously on Sunday, he's got to go to Madison where he just put an absolute curb stomping on the 7A. So he's got to go there. Them are the four races where I would expect to see the one TPO. Okay. All right. Well, I will take us home. Any further or last comments by either of you? We're good to go. All right. That wraps up a long episode, but I'll tell you what, this is one of the biggest weekends that we have around. Football starts Thursday night. We got the horn up there for Ryan. We got the Green Bay shirt here for Bert. Find Bert Lehman on Facebook at Bert Lehman. Find Ryan at Ryan. Find me at Racer Puka. Uh, you know, thanks for joining us. If you like the show, give us a thumbs up. Maybe even share it. We'd appreciate that. Uh, like I said, we got a little bit of swag. You'll have to find Ryan, Bert, or I in order to track it down. We're not selling anything online yet. But, uh, you know, we've got hooded sweatshirts. Maybe we'll wear one of those next week. You guys can check that out. Uh, buy race shirts. Power rankings. BuyRayShirts.com power rankings will be out this week. Make sure you catch those on YouTube or Facebook. Of course, thank all of our great partners, Dirt Track Supply, l and Radiator, BuyRayShirts.com, RV Share, Call by Up Racing, Zuli's Race Engines, Blue Line Brews, and Vernon Racing, who are helping out with some of this invitational coverage. We said we love your comments. Throw them on here. The one to go show at gmail.com, too, if you want something more private, or you can always instant message us. We get it out there and say it every week to get out there and be your dream. You're tuned to the one to go show.